Welcome to Ball and Play, presented by Baseball News Club. We cover everything with a ball and stick around the world. We cover Major League Baseball, to international, Dominican, Australian, to Korean. We also cover NCAA Baseball Division I and softball, all the way on down, Little League softball, to T-ball. We cover over the line, wiffle ball, anything with a ball and stick. We will cover it here at Ball and Play. Please stop right now. I need you to subscribe. Please comment and also turn on your notifications. Thank you very much. And let's get started with this journey we call baseball. Welcome to Ball and Play, episode number six. This is your host, Sesmo. We got a fantastic show today. Thank you for listening to this podcast and downloading. If this is your first time, welcome to the podcast. We talk about everything, like I said in the intro, everything with the stick and ball. You're going to love this podcast. This is the best podcast out there, guaranteed. Today, we have a lot to talk about. We got a lot of exciting NCAA news. Uh, the CBA, we're going to give you an update. Uh, very frustrating with that. MLB, stop drug testing for steroids. Don't get your hopes up. Um, designated hitter talk. Continued Hall of Fame talk. Jeremy Giambi's in the news. David Cavell, Oakland A's in the news. Mike Trout, Clayton Kershaw. woo Joe West, Trevor Bauer, Ken Rosenthal. We're going to go over ESPN came out with their top 100. Yeah, all time. I don't know. But anyways, let's jump on into it, guys. Welcome back to the episode. <clears throat> um, last week, I took it off. Uh, reason being, I had the show all ready to go, and I got a text the night before. Me and my buddies want to go fishing. Haven't been fishing since summer, and uh, I dropped everything, all my responsibilities, just like a mature adult does, and I went fishing for the day. In fact, I went fishing so long, I forgot I had a dog at home. So, uh, Oops. I had to call on the neighbors to come over and let my dog out. Anyhow, we got a fantastic show. Super excited. Um, today is February 15th. And this is normally when we get pitchers and catchers reporting. That is not going on. Uh, frustrating, yes. But for those of us out there, you know, there's still hope at the end of the tunnel. I mean, light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, hey, I've been off for two weeks, so I need to get my baseball jabber going. But... I have faith baseball will be here. It's just frustrating because we've followed the process. It's for the CBA. It's was on the train tracks. Now it's off the train tracks, but we'll get into that. But I've been seeing more on other news uh, pickup in other areas of wiffle ball and blitz ball. Starting to see a lot more activity on social media. So glad seeing that out there. But uh, one thing I want to do before we continue is thank Certain followers, uh, Pandora, Mobile, Safari, UI, WebView, iHeartRadio, iTunes. Those are our biggest uh, download fans. Uh, we're huge in the United States. We got fans in France and South Korea. Thank you very much abroad. And uh, like always, we talk about everything we can for you guys. Now, once the baseball season CBA becomes a non-lockout or unlocked, Things are going to be flying, so be ready. I keep telling everybody, be ready, because once that is done, you're going to see all the free agency frenzy going on. The beginning of the season is going to be weird, guys. I think we're going to be missing some spring training. Um, once the CBA gets kicking, I think the first, you know, if they can get this started before the season, regular season is supposed to start, that would be cool if we can get that far. And we can get it started because then you get all the trade frenzy at the beginning of the season. But we might be looking like going in 40 games in, 50 games in, and teams are still kind of shuffling. Um, I don't know. Hopefully that's not the case. Let's move on to some super, super exciting news. Uh, college baseball, college softball is here. Uh, there are, you know, games going on right now. Today, for girls softball, there's been games going on. And then there's also uh, men's baseball this thursday so it's already here guys now here's the theme and this is what i want to encourage you just because we don't have mlb i'm a huge college fan get into college man get your fix 
through college. You'll love it. There are so many teams. Super exciting. And I challenge you, follow softball, man. Follow baseball and softball. I don't care if you're a baseball guy. Don't be one of those little cupcake, uh, bottle wrap, cupcake eating fans where you're like, oh, girl softball, it's not real baseball. Don't be a sexist moron, man. It's everything with a ball and stick. That's the world of ball and play. That's the world of baseball news club. That's what we're about. Who cares what sex is playing what? Don't be afraid. That's what it is. It's a fear because you're afraid they're going to kick your ass in a game. And yeah, if I went on the field against college girls softball or even high school softball, I'd get creamed because it's a different sport and it's very unique. It's a quick game, an extremely quick game uh, on offense and defense and base running. It's fantastic. But I'm just saying, get into it, guys. Um, this year, there's a lot of predictions going on with female or the girls softball, excuse me. Uh, the top 25 is on NCAA.com, but if you haven't, uh, you got Oklahoma ranked number one. They were ranked number one last year. You know who they are. Uh, Alabama number two. Oklahoma State number three. UCLA ranked number four. Number five, Florida. Number six, Florida State. Number seven, Washington. Number eight, Arkansas. Number nine, Texas. Number 10, Mizzou, Missouri. And uh, so on and so, so forth. I challenge you to go to the website yourself and take a look at it. Um, things to look forward to this year. I mean, the Sooners are a top team. you got to expect them to be there. Alabama, UCLA, Florida, they're going to be top teams. It's always tough to repeat, but there's a lot of things that are going on this year that are going to be exciting. It's a lot of players to watch. Uh, some big storylines. Jocelyn Allo, is she going to break the NCAA home run record, which was set by Oklahoma's uh, Lauren Chamberlain? She's seven home runs away from you know doing that so that's going to be interesting and then the new transfers coming in at oklahoma state see what kind of numbers ellish can put up after two seasons off uh, the rise of the acc um you know clemson duke notre dame virginia uh, battle it out in the acc so it's going to be interesting the big 10 uh that's going to be interesting this season and also there's you know a lot of other players you need to keep an eye on jocelyn allo Charla Eccles, Kayla Kowalk, uh, Valerie Cagle, Kylie Rochard, and Gabby Plain. There's a lot going on, guys. So, again, I challenge you to get into it. There are games going on today. I'm looking at the schedule right now, um, or the scores. Uh, today's, again, the 15th. Green Bay plays UTSA. Texas A&M plays Sam Houston. San Diego plays San Diego State. So, there's, I'm looking at at least, in front of me right now, 10. 10 games, guys. Oh, 10, 11, 12, 13. So there's a, a bunch of games going on. You can definitely get your fix. So check that out. But if let's bounce on over to the men's side. Uh, the men's are also playing this week. Now when we go over to the men's side, Division I, uh, you start off Texas. They were previously third last year. They're ranked number one. Arkansas, number two. Vandy boys come in at number three. Uh, Mississippi State, number four. Ole Miss, number five. Stanford, six. Oklahoma State 7, LSU 8, number 9, Florida, and then number 10, NC State. And again, you go check it out yourself. Go out there and uh, look at all the information at NCAA.com. Um, if you, you know, in the top 25, there's nine teams in the top 25 that previously weren't ranked. So that's interesting. That's a lot. Uh, Oklahoma State, Florida, Florida State, Georgia, Oregon State, Georgia Tech, Duke, Long Beach State, and Miami. All entered the Division One Top 25 poll, so that's kind of cool. So that's new for us this year, and um, you know, players to watch: uh, Brooks Lee, Cal Poly, Logan Tanner, Mississippi State, Jace Chung, and Texas Tech, uh, Dylan Cruz, and Jacob Berry of LSU, uh, Bob Moore, Arkansas. So there's a lot, but again, I got to challenge you guys. I'm not going to read everything here on NCAA.com. I'm just letting you guys know. College is on, man. Get into it. Don't, don't let baseball upset you. Okay, let's go into the next subject. MLB, stop testing for steroids. Don't get your hopes up, guys. Don't get all crazy there. You're not going to see your smallest player on your team all of a sudden buffed by another 50 pounds. But there's not testing right now. This is the first time in 20 years that they've this has happened. So it's been a drug program going on. And this is hand-in-hand hand with the CBA, obviously, right now. Um, expiration of the sports joint drug program. So... 
status expired. But again, this is hand in hand with the CBA. So I'm sure once the CBA is ironed out, they're going to have a new drug testing program. I don't see MLB going forward <laughs> without having any type of drug testing program. Come on, guys. That would just, that'd be crazy. That would be crazy. Uh, you see all these guys looking like Mark McGuire rocking around the field. Uh, fielding would suck because everyone would be too bulky. But hey, if you're a player, juice up now. Get your juice on, man, because they ain't testing. That's very interesting. But again, I I, did, I think it's just headlines because the CBA is still not been ironed out. So that's that. Now, let's move on to designated hitter. Now, when we've been following the news with the CBA and what I've been reporting, what other news outlets have been reporting is there's no talk really about designated hitter, uh, expanded playoffs. The only talk was pretty much like, hey, they've already came to agreement on that stuff. That's how it's been listed. Uh, the main things that have been going back and forth is the luxury tax, uh, you know, salary arbitration timing, <clears throat> free agency, you know, other things like that are on the table. But the DH, if you guys think about it, first off, pitchers didn't hit that well last year. Way low 100s overall average. But we're pretty much there now. If you think about it, modern day pitching starters don't get a third at bat you know usually starters nowadays you don't want you know the the way baseball has progressed that we're so good that by the time the second or third at bat comes around to a starter pitcher players are getting better and better and figuring out how to hit that pitcher i'm saying in general obviously you're not going to probably be that way against cole or you know other top pitchers but the fact is as a pitcher in the national league it's kind of 50% designated hitter now, if you think about it. Uh, pitchers are only getting one or two at-bats. And then then you're going to have pinch hitters the rest of the game. And there's not really full-time players. I mean, Nelson Cruz, yeah. Uh, I see Albert Pujols, if the DH starts in the National League, maybe going to St. Louis. And utilizing that because he's... I mean, have you seen... The, I don't know if you guys saw the videos I posted on YouTube, Baseball News Club. Check us out plug i don't know if you guys checked it out but during the light on playoffs pulls i mean his running has really gone downhill he's, he's really struggles to run he, he definitely has a piano on his back but this is where it's going to help his career but it's already kind of there if you think about it we're kind of 50 percent dh because once the starter gets pulled every other nine slot batter is going to be a pinch hitter you're not going to put in your uh, relief pitcher unless you're doing something like a squeeze play or something weird like that but for the most part uh it's already there we're already kind of there so all we're doing is kind of eliminating the first two at bats for a pitcher that's you know if you want to look at it that way that's a way to look at it but it's i think it's something that is going to be here and it will be announced and they've already figured it out both sides already want it we've already talked about it numerous times so that's that DH is coming, is my uh, my prediction. I don't think it's too far off. Now, moving on to other news, Hall of Fame continued talk. Man, the backlash. I wouldn't say backlash, but the fact that David Ortiz got in first ballot with his PD related, it's just a sign of things to come. Major League Baseball has changed our You've seen more D, uh, DH time players get in with Edgar Martinez and, and Frank Thomas. And you guys got to understand, before that, the only person with that much DH time was Paul Molitor way back in the day. And Paul Molitor played every single position on the field with the exception of, I think, pitcher and catcher in his career. So Paul Molitor was a true, to me, Hall of Famer. You played the field and you're able to bat. He was what I called the Paul Molitor you know, measuring stick. Anyone that got into the Hall of Fame, because Paul Molitor, I think, spent up almost a... F and this is towards the end of his career when he was with Toronto, but towards the end of his career, Paul Molitor spent more time on the designated hitter role. Now, he had upwards, I think, 45% or so of his career right in the pine. And to that point, nobody had exceeded that much to get into the Hall of Fame, that much time on the books riding the pine. Until you got... Frank Thomas and Edgar Martinez getting in. I mean, we're talking those two cats. Uh, I, I I can't remember the exact stat, but we're talking almost 60 to 70% of their career riding the pine. 
they only played in the field 30% and they got into the Hall of Fame. And that was the argument with Frank Thomas is like, dude, way too much time on the books on DH, but we brought the DH in in the 70s. This is a thing that's been part of the American League. Here we are. You now have, for the first time, a Hall of Famer with DH time on the books. We're not going to bring up Harold Bangs because he, you know, anyhow. Um, but that's kind of the, the thing, you know, you have to reconcile as a fan. Like, God damn, where are my beliefs? Because you... That's where people talk about being a traditionalist because they go, oh, you're a traditionalist. You don't want the DH. You, you know, some people prefer the lowest scoring games. Some people, but you can still have low scoring games and have the DH. But again, this is where we're at. We got Hall of Fame people in there with DH time. So the next gradual step is either Hall of Fame writers are going to be stubborn and only allowing people with DH time and not PED because traditionally that's how it's been. I mean, think about it. Since the 80s, if you had anything to do with gambling, drugs, PEDs, you had no freaking chance of getting in the Hall of Fame. Times have changed, guys. We've progressed. And this, in a way, is a lot of what fans wanted. Even though what you call traditionalists didn't want those people at DH time in the books in the Hall of Fame. But here we are. And now we got another guy with DH time. With David Ortiz. But we've got a guy with DH time and tag to him PEDs. Now, his... When that whole thing came out in 2004, because they did the random or the test sampling in 2003 to determine if they need a test in 2004, again, he came up, he said positive, but then again, or his name came up on the list, but there's really hasn't been a developed or uh, presented details of the statistics on who was positive and who was not. Even uh, Rob Manfred came out and said, hey, yeah, there's some you know negative tests but they didn't say who so we don't know what he was tested for uh we don't have uh, david ortiz that is so it's still a gray area and then like i said when you talk about like a rod who and then uh you know roger clemens and and then barry bonds i mean those guys were all tied to the mitchell report and balco so those guys but ortiz was a little bit different ortiz was like oh his name was brought up his name was being dragged through the mud. He immediately attacked it with some really smart, uh, not marketing, but he put out his saying, hey, I, it was supplements, it was this. I, I never had been dirty, and he's been tested a million times since then, and he's been clean. So that's kind of holding weight towards his statement. And that's kind of what with the fans and what baseball went with. They're like, yeah, you know, maybe David wasn't dirty, even though his numbers went nuts after starting 2004. I mean, again... I don't think it takes a genius to figure out what's going on. But, hey, if you don't get caught, you don't get caught. I'm not saying that he did or didn't do PDs, but he probably did. Probably did some type of PD because we have people in the Hall of Fame with PD. I wouldn't be too surprised if Cal Ripken did something to keep his streak going. But, again, that's baseball protecting the sport. I don't really care about that. My only thing I want to bring up with the point is the conversation has been going on. I mean, I've been seeing 50-50. People are still very upset that David Ortiz got in and he got in first ballot. And then we don't got Helton or Roland or, you know, other guys in there that are deserving. Maybe next year. But now this leads into the conversation. What's this do for A-Rod? You can't ignore those numbers. The guy had monster, but to be in trouble with PEDs and be suspended as much as A-Rod did, that just, that puts the stops on that. So the Hall of Fame talk. Uh, David Ortiz is in the Hall of Fame. He does have Hall of Fame numbers. Again, the only thing with him is that PED relation. And like we talked about last podcast, there's got to be a solution. There's been a lot of a lot smarter people than me, like Dan Patrick and other guys like that, uh, talking about. And there's been a handful of the top like sports personalities out there calling for this. Is we just listen. Bonds is a Hall of Famer. I don't care how you cut it. Roger Clemens is a Hall of Famer. All of us can take PEDs, but to perform at the level they did on PEDs and the, the do their whole damn career, it's different. It's different. And I agree with Dan Patrick and the other media giants out there that understand the sport and been involved in it deep, is they feel like we should allow them in the Hall of Fame, but just put a different description on their plaque. You know, Barry Bonds, great player, Pittsburgh, San Francisco, you know, did this, did that. And the very last sentence say, however, you know, not however to say Barry Bonds played in the PED era. And you can just leave it at that. Just like, hey, 
this guy played during that era, you look into how you want to judge him. You know, uh, that way for T's, he can have that on his plaque. Bonds could get in there on his plaque, but not now because he's no longer on the ballot. But I'm just saying that's the conundrum that the baseball writers have to deal with right now. I don't know. I don't know. So let's move on to other news. Joe West, speaking of Hall of Fame, is Joe West a Hall of Famer? Joe West, the everybody's favorite umpire, next to Angel Hernandez, he had umpired and, and he retired last year, but uh, 5,460 games that started in the 70s. Everyone knows who Joe West is. He's actually a really big dude, man. Um, but there's talk, is he a Hall of Famer? Uh, he's going to get in the Hall of Fame. I mean, no doubt. Just because the players and the fans didn't like him doesn't mean baseball itself obviously liked him because they gave the guy a job forever. Uh, so Joe S and Tom Brady are out of the sports. How's that going to rock each sport? The NFL, baseball, kidding. But hey, there it is. He's retired. Now, one thing I want to get back to that's probably going to piss off some people. Where's all the Ken Rosenthal fans, man? When he got fired or he got let go from major league baseball, I couldn't believe all the chicken littles on social media just going, Oh, that's bullshit baseball. I'm not watching the game again. Oh, this is Hey, man, you're asking for change. You're asking for baseball to be progressive, and here's an example. Maybe they just want to get away from him and maybe plug in somebody else. Hey, we might get a female in there. We might get Ken Griffey Jr. He's now working for Major League Baseball. So who knows who's going to be plugged in there? But I don't think, to me, as a baseball fan, eh, I don't really care if Ken Rosenthal is there or not. I'm being totally honest with you. It doesn't matter to me. Um, He was okay to me. I prefer other announcers, but hey, It doesn't bother me that he's no longer there is what I'm saying. I'm not going to go on social media and be all upset about it. I'm just like, yeah, oh, well, the guy's gone. Screw it. You know, no more bow tie. Let's get somebody else in there. Let's get change. Again, CBA is going to create change. All these awesome players coming up the pipeline, change. Uh, You've seen how the sport's been changing lately with celebrations, change. Getting rid of Ken Rosenthal, part of that change. It's just part of baseball changing, guys. I wouldn't take it personally, but again, my point of bringing up Ken Rosenthal is I haven't seen one post since that week that his announcement of being, you know, because when you get social media and you get news to put it on the forefront, forefront, everybody talks about it. But when they take it off the forefront, they put it on the back burner. Nobody talks about it. That's called bandwagoning. That's called chasing, ambling chasing, whatever you want to call it. But that's also called news. That's how you build comments. But hey, he's no longer on the radar is my point. So, um... Let's talk a couple other things. Let's get into Mike Trout and Clayton Kershaw. Now, show he is the face of MLB, but not the best player. ESPN said something this week, and I'm just going to touch on this. And, you know, we're talking about ESPN. We're talking about uh, the guys, they don't really follow. I mean, b- baseball's good, but th- ESPN's not a source for baseball anymore. You know what I'm saying? It used to be, but I think nowadays as fans, our source for baseball, is we go to a different route. We don't go to ESPN because we realize over time these guys, you know, other than like Jeff Passan and a couple of people at ESPN, the majority of ESPN and baseball is horrible. I'm sorry. It's not good. And then this week they came out and said, is Mike Trout washed up at 30? That really shook. I mean, <laughs> the comments, man. Woo! That was something I like to... Like I said, I always follow comments in different social media places and news outlets to get the pulse of what's going on in baseball. Man, when ESPN said that, and that must have been something just to stir the pot. They had to say that just to stir the pot. But, man, the comments, the venom that was coming from the fans about saying that about Mike Trout. Now, here's the thing. There might be some truth to that. We've been talking about Mike Trout, the mystery and what's going on with that. That injury he had, it went from a couple weeks, and now they're saying he's, they're preparing him for spring training. What do you mean preparing him? Is he playing or not for spring training? And I also have talked about how I've seen Ronald Acuna in the batting cages showing he's healthy and ready to go. Nothing with Mike Trout. But for ESPN to say that, it does hurt. I think some fans are super protective over Mike Trout because he's one of the, he's the GOAT. He's the GOAT. I get it. But there's some fans that are so possessive, they must be just curled up and crying on their carpet after the conversation. So I think some fans take it so personally. It's like, dude, relax. It's just a conversation. I have the right to my opinion. But the venom that came out against ESPN on that comment, you know, there might be some truth to it, guys. I mean, 
I don't think that's the case. Uh, I think Mike Trout has got a ton of baseball left in him, but dude, this type of injury to your foot is going to take away so much power and ability for you to swing. If he's truly, if there's again, you have to go into like, what the hell's going on with Mike Trout? It's just been this mystery in baseball since it happened. He was having a fabulous start to 2021, but what the hell's going on with Mike Trout? And that's, I think, ESPN's kind of angle is he's washed up. And the Angels aren't ready to admit it, just like they weren't ready to admit Pujols was a mistake and he's washed up. I'm not saying Trout's a mistake, but if you look at the writing on the wall, Trout has been talking a couple times about he's not happy being in L.A. He wants to be in the competitive team. And L.A.'s looking to move money around. You got Shohei coming up down the road. They're going to have to pay Shohei more. So what's going to happen with Trout? Now, here's something to think about. And this is something as fans we don't think about. And especially if you're an older fan, this stuff you'll understand. But players don't play on the same team forever. That's the reality for Angel fans and Mike Trout fans. He's probably not going to be playing in that uniform much longer. It just doesn't happen anymore. The days of a player like Derek Jeter are very, very rare. And yeah, you're getting big contracts, Fernando Tatis. You know, you're going to get 10 to 13 to maybe 15-year contracts. That's the only time you're going to see a player play in a jersey for a long time. But my point is, is the days of seeing players play on the same team their whole career, it just doesn't happen. So even though it's weird to see Clayton Kershaw not playing in Dodger Blue, there's a good chance he's going somewhere because he's a free agent. And he's, there's talk of Texas Rangers. You see how the Texas Rangers are pouring money into that new stadium, pouring money into... Uh, their team this year in the offseason with a lot of good signings. It makes sense to put Clayton in there. Mike Trout, same thing. It's logically the route that he's going, the way he's been talking, the way the Angels have been going. Uh, even though they wanted him to be a recruiter this year in the offseason, which is the weirdest thing. Uh, yeah, Angels had Mike Trout recruit and try to recruit other players. So it's like, okay, he can't, you know, what's going on with Mike Trout? You got him recruiting now. What is he is your newspaper boy? Is he is he out there? Is he working for Grubhub? What? Again, it's frustrating hell for me. I hope Mike Trout comes back. He's a hundred percent. I hope he's hitting the crap out of the ball for LA, because LA is actually they did. We've talked about it. How they've went after a lot of pitching in the off season right now. I'm not talking just one pitcher. Uh, international signings and draft signings. So they really went big on that. But what's going on with him? And I'm just saying for those of you out there, uh, you know the days back in the '50s when the for agency wasn't around that's why you saw guys like yogi Berra and you know all these players play on the same organization harlem killer brew for their whole careers but those days are long gone because in the 70s free agency came out and that's where you're seeing less and less players playing on their team i mean you look at a lot of hall of famers a uh, uh, wade boggs the example you thought he would be in a boston uniform his whole career you thought that albert Pujols would be in a st louis uniform his whole career you look at every player out there um, even Barry Bonds, Pittsburgh to San Francisco. So you think of the greatest A-Rod, uh, Roger Clemens, the greatest players, uh, Greg Maddox. They don't stay in the same uniform. So the chances of Mike Trout not being in L.A. have never been higher. And I'm sorry if that's a hard pill for you to swallow, but that's the fact. It's the days of Mike Trout in L.A. are coming to an end probably. Um, you got to think of the money that's out there. They got Shohei they're going to have to give a lot of money to. Uh, all the pitching and young talent coming up they got to pay. Uh, you still got a very big salary. Are you going to be able to pay Mike Trout another big contract, five or eight year contract? I don't know. I would like to see Mike Trout on some other teams personally. I think Mike Trout would look awesome on some other teams. I mean, what's wrong with Mike Trout being in Boston? I mean, imagine him hitting the green monster. God, he'd be denting the hell out of the green monster. So, something to think about. Again, the mystery continues. And let's move on to other news. Uh, Okay, and sad news. uh, Jeremy Giambi, who was the brother of Jason Giambi, who is a five-time All-Star, committed suicide uh, this week. Not much more information. There was a gunshot wound to the head is what they're talking about. Um, he only hit 263 with 52 homers, 209 RBIs, but he was the brother of Jason, so that was what he was also known for. He played for Oakland. If you want more information, research it yourself, but uh, bad news there. Now, we've talked about this on the show before. Uh, if you know anybody that's going through rough times, um, there is a national suicide hotline. 
And that number, uh, National Suicide Prevention Lifeline, 1-800-273-8255. Again, 1-800-273-8255. Please reach out to friends or family if you're someone that has those thoughts. There's always someone out there to reach out to. Hey, man, get out and go for a walk, man. You know, when they talk about depression, there's no real, like, cure, they say, to a point other than changing your lifestyle. Hey, man, if you're feeling bum, I know wintertime does that to all of us. You know, we get cooped up indoors, and then the minute the sun comes out, you feel so much better to get outside. Um, you know, again, reach out to somebody, man. It's it's not, you know, depending what you're going through, uh, most likely it's not as bad as you think it is. But again, there's people out there at the National Hotline. Reach out to a friend or family. And again, if you know anybody out there that you think is depressed or having thoughts of suicide, reach out to them, man. Be a friend. You know, that, that might be all that they need is somebody to reach out. So let's move on to other news. Yashiel Puig. Uh, we've been following his journey. He arrived in South Korea uh, in the last two weeks. Uh, there was a photo posted on his IG account. It's kind of funny because he arrives at the South or South Korean airport. And he's got this big old bag. And it's all his equipment and stuff. And it says LA Dodgers on the front. So he still has swag from back in the day with the Dodgers. But he arrived. I've been following him on his Instagram. He's got a really nice... Uh, apartment set up next to the ocean so wherever they got him put up it's really nice and you know he's he's posting fun things with his teammates playing together uh, that league's starting up right now so get into it uh, there's spring training are getting ready for the uh, Korean league so you got to follow that guys uh, you can follow it on VIP box there's some games you can get but the times are late at night or early in the morning so you just kind of have to be ready to take a look at that uh, in Hunt It Down, VIP box, you can watch them free, but that's the latest news on him. And speaking of, uh, he was playing in the Lightem series. There was the Lightem Caribbean Finals. So the Caribbean series uh, is over. They crowned a new champion recently with uh, Colombia defeating the Dominican Republic 4-1. to So there it is. That's out of six countries that competed uh, you had Colombia, Dominican Republic, Mexico, Venezuela, Panama, and Puerto Rico. Um, another great, you know, light em championship, guys. You guys missed out on it. And it was really weird is I had a problem watching that on my MLB subscription. I would turn it on and I would see it was supposed to be on and it wouldn't be on. And then later on it would be on. I don't know what's going on with that. But you know what, MLB, you ripped me off this year, man. You didn't give me all my Dominican ball the way I wanted it. Kind of disappointed in that, but hey, the, that series is over, so we're gonna have to wait till next year. That was an exciting year to watch, uh, Lightum and the Caribbean series, and I hope you guys got into it. But hey, there's also next year. But again, get into it, guys. You got Nippon baseball, you got South Korean baseball, you got college ball starting up in Division One, girls and men's. Uh, we've got a lot of baseball guys, and I know we're supposed to have catchers and pitchers report, but hey, here we go. You know, we're at this point. What are we going to do? You got other baseball. My point is, you got other baseball. There's no excuse. Get out there and watch some other baseball. Support baseball. Now, speaking of baseball, let's go on to other news. Trevor Bauer. We always got to talk about Trevor Bauer. Um, recently, LA uh, law enforcement said they're not going to charge Trevor Bauer in the case. So what we've been waiting for for a long time is... For the district attorney's office to make a decision and then MLB and like we've been talking about MLB has been waiting for LA to make a decision on charging him they are not charging him so he's already got the judge to throw out the restraining order from the girl that he was involved in now LA is not going to charge him with any crime again this puts MLB in a really awkward position and despite how you feel about Trevor Bauer, and despite how you feel about his situation, look at it from a logical point of view. Like if you're in court and you're a judge and you're trying to make a decision, don't think of the guy's name or what he's done. You got to look at the evidence at hand. And that's why I think uh, he wasn't charged. It's just, a, it's really screwed up because here's a sexual interaction with two people that happened multiple times. A girl that's a very interesting lifestyle being tied to Fernando Tatis and other MLB players, uh, Fern- Fernando, Mike Clevenger, you know, it's just really weird how she's sleeping around with some of these athletes. And Trevor Bauer, <clears throat> now that she had multiple sexual experiences with Trevor Bauer, rough, and they both liked it rough. But then, 
something happened. I, again, I don't know that world of rough sex. I understand there's safety words. I don't know what happened, but obviously he's not. Law enforcement doesn't think he did a crime. Now, in the minds of the public and fans, a lot of people have turned on Trevor Bauer and thinks it's disgusting what he did. Because if the fact did happen that, yeah, you're having rough sex, we get it. You know, what you do in your bedroom is your own private business. But if it went from something that was just sex into violence, that's where fans have a problem with. Uh, I think fans have a problem with the way Trevor's been handling it. He's, he's been pretty much the way you should be handling it. But because he had fans had so much access to him in his personal life before and all of a sudden it stopped. I mean, he's still posting stuff, but it wasn't like it was before. It wasn't as in-depth and personal. But what is the situation with him? Uh, what is Major League Baseball going to do? It's a very tough thing because, again, we could judge him, the public, us. We could judge him in our own eyes. But what really happened? Because what about if she's not telling the truth? What about if he's not telling the truth? It's hard to tell. You want to side with her because, obviously, you saw what happened to her face and her body. But... You know, how much rough sex, you see what I'm saying? It's such a frustrating thing because you're like, at what point was it not sex anymore? And it turned into violence. The last 10 seconds or, you know what I'm saying? So they had multiple sexual experiences. So it's very hard. So for me as a person and a fan, it's like, God dang, I don't even know what to think of it because you don't know what the truth is. I don't want to sit there and say, oh, Trevor, you're a scumbag. And it turns out she's trying to scream over for money. Or I don't want to do the other side and feel not empathy and sympathy for her if he crossed the line. But then if he didn't cross the line, then you're, you see what I'm saying? There's a conundrum. You're just like, man, I want to pick sides here and I'm going to lean towards her because, you know, domestic violence is a horrible thing and a majority of the time it happens to the female. But what do you do? I mean, it's, it's like you don't want to play, I'm going to sit on the fence, but what do you do? And even worse, what is Major League Baseball going to do? You... He's going to get some type of suspension, I think, because they can still categorize it as their domestic violence uh, under their domestic violence policy. But, I mean, when you look at all the other players that have been busted for domestic violence at Major League Baseball, dude, there was more evidence. There was usually police reports. There was definitely proof that something went on. This, because it involves sex, the other ones were just like, you know, this is just domestic situations. It was non-sexual. This is the first case where it's sexually related and you're going, oh, 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 wait a minute. Now we got a whole different, they're having sex and this happened? Oh, shit. Because if they weren't having sex, it's clear cut. Trevor's suspended. He's getting charged. But people like rough sex. There is a group of percentage of people out there that like it rough, 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 rough. And I'm not trying to make fun of it, but you know what I'm saying. If Go Google it. Just do it at the library. I, I'm kidding. Um, I'm just saying that it's just, it's hard to figure it out. And how is Major League Baseball going to figure it out? That's the tough thing. How are you going to punish him, punish him for one year? How are you going to justify that? How are you going to justify six months? How are you going to justify 20 days? What are you going to do? But the problem with Trevor Bauer is like we've always talked about, he's got a target, the size of the target shopping center on his back. Major League Baseball don't, they have not liked him for a long time. They do not care for him. I think what they're going to do is they're going to use his sticky ball situation and this situation and combine it and give him like a, the biggest sentence they can to suspend him. But either way, none of it makes sense. He hasn't broken the law according to the law. It's messed up, man. It really is. I, I just hope they figure out something. Now, uh, let's move on to other news. Um, yeah, I like to piss people off when I talk about things. Uh, when I talk about Ozzy Smith in the news, it usually raffles a lot of people's feathers. I recently like to raffle feathers, and I did it with some social media, and people got upset because I don't think Ozzy Smith, I think he's overrated. And this is where people are probably dropping their drinks right now and changing the channel. Hey, man, uh, he was a fielder. He wasn't a hitter. And when I think of great shortstops, I think of Derek Jeter. I think of Cal Ripken. You know, I think of guys like Jimmy Rollins. I was myself was a shortstop. I was a bit of a punch and Judy hitter. I wasn't much of a power hitter, but I get it because I identify with Ozzy because I grew up in San Diego. He couldn't hit water if he fell out of the boat. That's why San Diego got rid of him and he went and played on artificial turf his whole career in St. Louis. 
that makes your fielding much more easier. And again, I've played on artificial turf. I've played shortstop on artificial turf. It's the best to field on. You get such true bounces. You don't have to worry about the infield having divots in the ground. It's just, it's faster, but it's awesome. So it makes you as a batter, you can get on base better because those little base hits that before would be fielded are going through the infield. All I'm saying is, I think he's a great, he's not the greatest shortstop ever. Not even close. I don't think he can even play in today's game, to tell you the truth. And great fielder? Yes. One of the greatest fielders of all time. But I've seen better plays in college. I've seen better plays in high school than that one-handed grab that he had. That would have makes a big deal out of it. For one, he missed it with his glove, and he got lucky and threw his arm up and caught it. Yeah, it's a great play. Don't get me wrong. But I'm just not one of those people that is going to sit there and get all upset over the fact that someone disagrees with you that Ozzie Smith isn't the greatest ever. And I'll be the first one to say I don't think he was. He's First off, he's not the greatest shortstop ever. No way. If you take overall shortstop, he couldn't carry Derek Jeter's jock. And actually ESPN came out with their top 100, which we're going to talk about here in a minute. And Ozzie was 67th. I think Jeter was 25th or 27th. And there was a bunch more uh, shortstops in front of Ozzie Smith in that list. So to me, it's like, you know what? I get it. He's a great fielder. Everyone loved his little flip on the field. And it's funny, the flip on the field he would do was okay, but players flipping their bats not. See the contradiction? Um, anyhow, I love the ruffle feathers, and I did it this week. And then this, you could tell this young man, he was a teenager. He did not like the fact I didn't like Ozzie Smith, and he's thrown. I could always tell someone that never watched Ozzie Smith play because the first thing they do is they start throwing metrics at you. And that's the funny part. I mean, as immediately he went into the war, he went into stats, uh, fielding stats, and I'm all, first off, idiot, there was no uh, sabermetrics in the 80s. I didn't start till um, Billy Bean and Oakland A's in the early 90s. So there's not really much fielding stats on Ozzy Smith on his how far his range was and stuff like that. Again, he was a great fielder, don't get me wrong. But I'm, I would have been more impressed. I'm more impressed with Omar Vizquel. Way more impressed with him. Played on natural uh, infield his whole career. And some people, oh, it doesn't make a difference. It does make a difference, man. Why do you think they had the stuff? There's a reason why Major League Baseball put in the AstroTurf and had that, you know, Montreal and Houston and St. Louis. There's a reason why teams wanted this. It was the increased offense. That was the whole design. So the ball bring more excitement to the game. And over time, they realized it was a super, super dumb idea. And that's why teams went back to the, the old school. And they got rid of the artificial crap and... It also created a ton of injuries. You're essentially just putting fake carpet over fucking concrete. I mean, to dive on that stuff, and I've played on stuff like that before, and it freaking hurts, man. And what shocks me is how NFL and college players play on that stuff. That's insane. Um, but the digress, is he one of the greatest fielders? Yes. Not the greatest fielder, in my opinion. I don't care what kind of stats you throw up at me. There's better fielders, I believe, that have played the game with better range, better plays. Come on, Derek Jeter's 5.5 jump in the air, toss the first. That's way better to me than, you know, Derek Jeter's made way bigger plays in the playoffs than Ozzie Smith. I'm not saying Ozzie isn't a great one. I'm just saying he's, I think it's just a little overhyped. You got to admit, he's a little overhyped. And again, I saw him playing San Diego. I remember being that age because I remember my hearing all the adults Go, Ozzy Smith, a great fielder, but can't hit water if he fell out of the boat. I mean, the adults didn't like him because he couldn't hit worse shit. He didn't start hitting until he went to St. Louis. I mean, we're talking low 200s, guys. And he was a great fielder, but not a good hitter. So when we got Gary Templeton, that was a better deal for San Diego. He got a hitter and a fielder. And he helped us get to the World Series. So say what you say. I'm more of a fan of Gary Templeton than I am Khalil Green or Ozzy Smith. Just because I like him. He's a switch hitter. He's a smooth operator. He's a great, great player for San Diego. But again... I think my whole thing with Ozzie Smith comes from the fact that I'm a San Diego fan and a Gary Templeton fan first, then Ozzie Smith. So that's kind of where I come from. But again, I know some people are going to disagree with what I'm saying, but I could care less. I think he's a little overhyped. So let's move on to other news. Um, actually, let's go over ESPN's top 100 since we're already talking about it. And this is a fun list, guys. This is a super fun list. Um, let's go, you know, the... 100 to 51, there's some interesting names. I mean, you got Barry Larkin at 100. Uh, Jim Thome, really surprised me. He came in at 98. A uh, guy hit 612 home runs. 
Uh, almost 1,700 RBIs, 2,300 hits, and he's ranked 98. Okay, Beltre's in there. You know, a lot of good players. Bryce Harper at 94. Obviously, Bryce is going to continue to trend upward. John Smoltz, Roy Halladay, which is interesting is having Roy Halladay in front of John Smoltz. Just saying. Ryan Sandberg, Pudge Rodriguez at 90, one of the greatest catchers of all time. So that was kind of weird. Uh, Willie Stargell, Carlton Fisk, Roberto Alomar. So all these guys are there. Uh, Eddie Collins, Mike Piazza. Oh, man, what a great catcher. Robert Yunt, Hank Greenberg, Chipper Jones at 78. That kind of surprised me a little bit because Chipper is one of the greatest third basemen of all time, one of the greatest switch hitters of all time. So it's just kind of weird. Uh, Rod Carew, 75, which, I, again, I thought that was weird, too. I mean, the guy who was a 328 lifetime hitter, 3,000-plus hitter, just really weird. Uh, Juan Marichal. And what really struck me is Willie McCovey uh, at 73. 521 home runs, and you're Justin Verlander's ahead of you. So I don't know. Ozzy Smith at 69. And then what shocks you is you get Manny Ramirez at 68. <laughs> yeah. Manny Ramirez is higher than... Then Harlem Killerbrew, Al Kaline, and Willie McCovey. Okay. I mean, Manny was great. Don't get me wrong, but, dude, those are great players. Cal Ripken, way better shortstop than Ozzie Smith, in my opinion. All around, I'd rather have him on my team. When you're going to get offense, uh, which was weird is they got Max Scherzer at 65, Eddie Matthews. David Ortiz, the Hall of Famer, comes in at 63. So they didn't think that much of him. Uh, Miguel Cabrera, 59. I think that's right. I mean, Miguel. And then you have Dave Winfield at 56. Reggie Jackson, 55. Clayton Kershaw, 52. So, I don't I don't know. I like some of their picks. But, again, when you look at these picks, you're like, you know, this is ESPN. You know, these are guys that really don't know much about baseball anymore. Because, uh, I, I mean, come on, man. How can they? Um, crack in the top 50, you got Frank Thomas. The only guy with DH time this high up on the list at 49. Um, a lot of really good names. You got Ichiro at 46, Wade Boggs. What's interesting, you got Ichiro at 46, Wade Boggs at 45, and Tony Gwynn at 44. How is that possible? You have those three guys, uh, some of the best natural hitters in the game has seen in decades, and you bundle them all together. George Brett, 43, Nolan Ryan, 42. And then they've got some players who weren't even in MLB, which are – Satchel Page, dude, Satchel was great. Satchel would have dominated in the major leagues. Uh, Yogi Berra, 39. Jackie Robinson, 38. So, again, uh, you know, Josh Gibson, Negro League player, 35. Pete Rose, 34. So the greatest hitter of all time gets 34. It's interesting. Mariano Rivera is higher than Sandy Koufax and Bob Gibson. I get that. I mean, the body of work for Mariano is longer. Albert Pujols, 30. Hey. Derek Jeter, 28, greatest shortstop ever. And then they got, surprisingly, A-Rod at 26. Yeah, A-Rod, guys, A-Rod. I get it, though. I get it. Uh, Christy Matheson, 25. You got Randy Johnson, Ricky Henderson, you know, all on the top. You got Cy Young, Roger Hornsby, all those greats. But, you know, Roger Clemens, Joe DiMaggio, Mike Trout, number 15, Greg Maddox, 14, The Kid, 13, Onus Wagner, 12. Pedro Martinez, 11, which was kind of interesting. I don't know. Um, Stan Musel, 10. Walter Johnson, 9. Barry Bonds, 8. Yeah. Mickey Mantle, 7. Lou Gehrig, 6. Ted Williams, 5. Ty Cobb, 4, which was weird. I would think Ted Williams would be higher than Ty Cobb. Hank Aaron, 3. Willie Mays, 2. And you got it. The Bambino comes in at number 1. The greatest player ever, according to ESPN. So, hey, you know, it is ESPN. Take it with a grain of salt. ESPN's not the not the brightest on the top 100. Uh, I would disagree with a lot of those, but I'm not going to go into that. Now, win predictions. This is something I want to go over with you guys. Uh, win predictions already being put out there uh, in Vegas. And these are the odds as of right now. And now we've talked about this a lot. It's impossible to have these odds because uh, because of the current CBA and everything going on and free agency. This is going to totally change. But this is what they have right now. Uh, these are the odds to win the World Series. Los Angeles Dodgers, number one. Houston Astros. Atlanta Braves. New York Yankees at four. Chicago White Sox. 
Tampa Bay Rays, San Diego Padres, Milwaukee Brewers, San Francisco Giants, Toronto Blue Jays, Boston Red Sox. Those are your top teams, according to Las Vegas, as of today, to win the World Series. Interesting? Yeah. Yeah, a little bit. A little interesting there. But let's move on to some other news. Um, now, we've talked about this, and this is this is interesting. Um, you know, when you go into win predictions, it's kind of hard because we just read the what Vegas is predicting. And Boston went, you know, where's the first? Nobody talks about that last year when you're talking about coach of the year. But anyhow, let's talk about Oakland A's. There's been a lot going on with the Oakland A's. It's been very frustrating for the A's fans because you've got many different levels to it. Uh, one of the levels you have is Dave Stewart has got a committee together to revitalize a stadium. And then you've got the other level of the waterfront uh, plan that's been going on since, what, 2016, 17. And then you got the owners going to Las Vegas often in this last 12 months, meeting with Las Vegas uh, officials to get Oakland to move to Las Vegas. Now, what has happened is uh, A's Dave Cavell and company put in a bid for the Tropicana Hotel site last December. So they actually did put in a bid so they can move to Las Vegas. So as an A's fan, when you hear that news, you're bummed because the ownership definitely wants to leave Oakland. No doubt. But the problem happens with they lost a bid to Ballet's Corporation. So they they missed out on the top Vegas site. They lost a bid to Bally's Corporation, so they're missing out on the top Vegas site. So Howard Terminal just received a boost in the Pacific Northwest, just, you know, a little interest. But honestly, through this whole process, um, I haven't heard one sentence or line anything to do with the Pacific Northwest and Portland bringing baseball. So that's very interesting because Portland is trying to get a team. So it's not like the Howard Terminal or the A's old stadium is now just it's back on the plate. So they missed out on the top Vegas site. They were here's the thing that's interesting as an A's fan. What about if they did get that? You're it's going to be the Las Vegas A's. You're moving, but now you might be staying in the Bay Area. Let's move on to other news. We're going to talk to CBA. I know you guys have been waiting for this all day. CBA, we've been going back and forth since early December. Um, now, as we've gone through the progression talking about the CBA and what's been going on, it's been good news for the most part. Uh, you know, we talked about how they met one day, they met again the next, and they started meeting a bunch of times. So it was the most positive thing to see the owners, uh, you know, Major League Baseball and MLB Players Association negotiating. But then, you know, we've talked about this is like who's going to tip their cap first? Because it went back and forth. The owners have now tipped their cap, threatening not to have the regular season on time. We read that a few weeks ago. So as you think about this as a fan, you're going, okay, who's to blame here? Who's to blame in this process? Because I want to blame the players because I think they're money hungry, but I want to blame the owners because they make the game difficult. Whatever floats your boat. But again, if you've gone through and paid attention since December, it's been a perfect neutral back and forth uh, they've come out and said they've agreed on the extended playoffs. They didn't say they're going to put the expanded playoffs in the DH into place. They just said that they agreed on it. So that could have been agreed not to have it, or it could be agreed to have it. But the only talk that we've been seeing mainly is the owners uh, not wanting to agree on free agency time and also salary arbitration. Players, uh, Owners didn't want to do that. Owners want to focus on the luxury tax. That's been talked about a lot. And also the players have not been wanting the service time manipulation like with Chris Bryant. Uh, they want these young players playing on day one, not staying in the minors till later on the season. The players are basically wanting to eliminate uh, tanking so you can get draft picks. Because if you think about it, that has always been a problem in a lot of sports for a long time. The tanking to get draft picks. It just doesn't work, guys. You don't need to do that to draw on fans for years. You put good baseball out there, things are going to get better. And by with expanded playoffs and what the players are 
been saying since I've been telling you guys since day one, they just want to put a good product out on the field. They just want to play great baseball for the fans. Players come from that point of view. Hey, we're players. We play the game. We like to get blood and dirt you know, on our bodies. We want to go balls out. We want to play the game. That's a player's attitude and point of view. Owners, hey, it's a business. We got to look at the bottom line. I get it. But the owners have tipped their cap, and now you have to look at them, blaming them. And you know what I look at it as I look at it is like, you ever play baseball or let's say football? It's playing football at a field. You got uh, all of a sudden you're at some random field and all these kids from the neighborhood come out and you got this great football game going on, touch, tackle, whatever. And the kid that owns the football, I don't know, he's not getting the ball passed to him or he's not allowed to be quarterback, whatever the case is. He gets pissed, decides to take the ball and leave. That is what I'm seeing MLB ownership doing right now. So that's the kid that gets upset, takes his ball, and leaves the game. That's what Major League Baseball, they're now threatening, going, hey, we're not going to have regular season games. And it continued to get worse. Then they went into Federal Mediation and Conciliation Service, an independent federal government organization. So the not only did they wait 45 days because they are on vacations before they started negotiating with the players, then they wanted a federal mediation. Then they wanted a threat in having regular season. So, you know what? Here's the thing. This is you guys, Rob Manfred. This is you doing this. This is you making these decisions. These aren't the players. The players are obviously wanting to sit down and negotiate. When I see the owners doing this, they're doing the whole little kid taking his football and walking away. I'm not getting my way. I don't care about you. I'm leaving so none of you can play. That's the most selfish thing you could do. And then Rob Manfred, you know, he continues to step on landmines on last Thursday. And let's, you know, let's, you know, let's be clear on this. The MLB called the press conference, not the Players Association. This was MLB. And then Rob gets up there and brags, you know, the history of baseball, the, uh, to make a later agreement without dispute. I'm the only person to ever do it, you know, so he's all bragging about it you know he's bragging how he used to be a negotiator back in the day and it's just weird you know you've got this game that everyone's waiting to come back catchers and pitchers are supposed to be reporting and you're up there bragging you know about hey i've done it before so you're the leader of baseball and you go out there bragging about what you've done before almost like hey i'm gonna get this done the players aren't going to get any, get away with what they want. I've done this before. I know how to make everybody get along. It's kind of a weird thing to do, but he's a weird guy. And, you know, and then they come out and they say, and I quote, Rob said this, if you look at the purchase price of franchises, the cash that's put in during the period of ownership and then what they've sold for, historically, the return on those investments is below what you'd get in the stock market, what you'd expect to get in the stock market with a lot more risk. Well, first off, owners, you're not on Wall Street. So what the hell, Rob? What? The, why would you even, you know, it's like he's saying, oh, they don't make money. You know, they're, the return is below the we get in the stock market. That, that's the biggest BS line I've ever heard in my life. There isn't one single major league owner that loses money on the baseball clubs. Maybe every now and then they, there might be an owner that might lose out. You're not going to buy a franchise unless you make money. When they sell these franchises, they're... For every time the franchise is sold, it's for way more than what it was sold before. Don't tell me that they're not making money. That's just a BS line to make it to where you're saying, hey, this is why we can't negotiate with the players because, you know what, we we don't have the money. So players are asking, you know, and players aren't stupid. They know there's money. So it just worries me that that's Major League's output, and now we're in fear of not having baseball. And for the first time ever, a lockout not being a first time ever lockout is going to happen and affect regular season games. That's never happened. Never in baseball history has a lockout affected regular season strikes. Yes, but this is what it's getting to. And the owners can make this happen. And it's just very, very frustrating. So there we go. Back and forth again. But again, guys, we got plenty of baseball out there. So get out there, watch some games, uh, softball. You got Korean baseball, you got Japanese baseball. It's all coming up, guys. Get your act together and start watching that stuff. And again, thank you guys for following us. Sorry we didn't have anything last week, but uh, thank you.
thank you for listening to Ball and Plays. Please download us. Please support us. Please comment and follow us on social media. This is Sesma signing out.